The Lord moved in a miraculous way yesterday. I told him this morning, every service the Lord teaches me something new about himself. Every time I stop here, the Lord reveals something new about himself. It takes me to a different dimension. It shows me a glory, an aspect of the glory I've not seen before. And every time I leave this place, I go, wow. And the thing is, I share this with my wife every time. The Lord said something to me when I left this place yesterday. He said, son, when I asked you to start the healing and deliverance service, I did it because I had someone in mind. Every time we come here for healing and deliverance service, it is because God has somebody in mind. He is the one who lives at 99 and goes for that one sheep. Hallelujah. He said to me, son, if you have to hold a service for one person, do it. Amen. I said, yes, sir. I told my wife, my wife said, uh-huh, you heard that? Okay. <laughs> and so every time I come, I rejoice. Now, yesterday I was dancing, dancing after the whole episode, you know, the Lord had to strengthen me, so I began to dance. Hallelujah. And as we were praising and I was dancing and the Lord was speaking to me and the people he wanted to touch and I was like, oh, glory to God, glory to God. And I held the mic. As a matter of fact, I told Mr. Lupe, I said, hold on, we'll take off from you at the end. The Lord was to move. And woo, how glorious was that be? My God. Please do not miss any service if you can. Every service is different. Yeah. It is the same pastor. <laughs> the same Holy Spirit. But right. yeah. a different move. Right. Every yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Every time. Hallelujah. Yeah. So, we've been talking on godly conduct in the church. When I began this series, you know, your pastor is always confessing his sins. So I'll confess another one too. When we began this series, as a matter of fact, when I was writing, the, the Lord made me write. And I was asking myself, I said, why, Lord, why? You know, there are some things that you tell me to write. And I said, well, this, this is too shallow. It's for babies. Why would I be teaching godly conduct in church? Everybody knows what to do in church. No, we need to teach it. And the first day I taught the series, we saw another mighty move. And people were giving their life to Christ. I was like, wow. People were crying. And so the Bible says he uses the foolishness of this world to confound what? The wise. Eh? Things that appear foolish, God uses it to confound the wisdom of the wise. Jesus said, thank you, Father, for hiding these things from the elite, those who think they know it all, and revealing them to their children. That is why you and I must always be humble to get what God has for us. And trust me, the Lord is teaching your pastor that too, teaching him humility. Stay there and hear from me. He resists the proud. The Bible says, but he giveth more grace to the humble. He doesn't just give grace, but he gives us more grace. And so we started talking about not be conducting church. I said there are two things that are needed. Before you come to church, the Bible says what? Come boldly. Never come to church beaten down. Don't come to church harassed by the enemy, intimidated by the devil. Come to church with boldness. No matter what you've done in the past, come boldly. Come to the one who is able to cleanse you. 
Those are able to redeem you, sanctify you, come to Jesus. And the Bible says, David speaking, it said, I was glad when they said to me, let us what? Go to the house of God. I said, there are two things we need. One, we need the spirit of joy, of gladness. Whenever you come to church, you cannot come, in, come to church looking as if the world slapped you the night before. <laughs> come to church happy. Even if my night was bad, the Bible says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy come to the morning. Yeah. And so when it's time to go to church, David said, I was glad. As bad as it was last night, I am going to the one who was able to turn around my story. Yeah. Yeah. I rejoice. So when you come in here, you should come smiling, shaking everybody. How are you doing? I don't overdo it and you run away. Amen. <laughs> well, come with a big smile on your face. And come with boldness. So the first thing that is required is that you come rejoicing and come with boldness. Now when you get to the house of God, what do you do? Number one, you listen to the word of God. I told us this. You have to listen. I'm not going to go through scriptures. This is my third week of this. I've been trying to finish this series. Um, but because, you know, people don't tell me enough, but I know I'm a good pastor. I'm just, you know, hallelujah. I'm just you know, tell you one or two things. Uh, Isaiah 2, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. It says, walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to here rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. When you come to the house of God, the Bible says, draw near to here. Amen. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts 20, verse 32. Acts 20, verse 32. Say, now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. I said the word of God is able to build you up. Learn to listen to the word of God. I commend you to the word of God. It's able to build you up. There are many, many scriptures. I'm not going to go through that again. Number two, when we come to the house of God, you and I are expected to worship. My heart bleeds when Christians come to the house of God and stare and not know what to do when it comes to time to worship. It means you are lacking basic foundational understanding. You were created to worship, just so you know. If I'm speaking into this microphone and no sound is coming out, it's not doing what it was created to do. And so it is what? Good for what? Nothing. Nothing. You are created to bring pleasure to God. Jesus said, John 4, 24. When I was speaking to that woman at the well, I talked about a time coming when those who worship will worship God in what? In spirit and in truth for what? Such the Father seeking. Seeking worshipers. Seeking worshipers. You learn to worship God, forgetting who you are, forgetting your problems, forgetting your challenges, and you worship God. Psalms 96, verse 4. Psalms 96, verse 4. The Bible says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. How is God to be praised? Greatly to be praised. Why? Because he is great. And he is not to be casually praised. And so when you come here dancing, it is because your God is greatly to be praised. I told them this morning, you dance, you worship, and you praise with careless abandon. 
not minding who is watching you. David never cared who was watching. Sometimes we carry this label on our head, a false status that we put on our head. I'm too big for this. You cannot be too big for God. Your problems cannot be too big for God. Lay them down and bless the name of the Lord. Let all the people praise you. Let all the people praise you. The Bible says, and the earth shall yield her increase. When you praise the Lord, something happens. Something happens. So come in here, praising and worshiping the Lord. Number three thing we need to do when we come to the house of God. Now this sounds foundational. Again, the Lord wants me to teach on this, so I will. Number three thing, when we come here, we pray. Jesus said, my house, my temple, my sanctuary, shall be known as what? The house of prayer. And so when you come in and people are praying, lifting up hands, praying in the spirit. Uh, don't think we are crazy. It's okay. That is what the house of God is for. It is not a socializing place. It is not a place where we drink coffee. Coffee is good as a matter of fact. I probably drink some after so. <laughs> You labor in prayer. 
It says it was fervently. That word fervently, I told us two weeks ago, fervently means to enter a contest. And so prayer is a contest. Ah. It also means to contend with adversaries. Some of you, if only you will spend one more minute, you will weaken the power of the enemy over your life. But because you are so weak in prayer, the devil seems to overcome you every time. Fervently means to overcome the adversary. And there's this verse I love about David in the house of David and the house of Saul. The Bible says that there was war between the house of David and the house of Saul. But the house of David grew stronger and stronger. While the house of Saul grew what weaker and weaker. Every time there's a contest, there's a wrestling match, one person overcomes. One, if they continue, after a while, you will say, I think the man on the right will win. Why? Because as the match continues, he grew stronger. For us, when we are supposed to overcome, we are overcome by the enemy. And so fervently means to contend with the adversary to fight. It means to strive to obtain something. When you are praying, you are striving to get something. But two things. Now you are contending with every power that is trying to stop you. Now what did the angel tell Daniel? From the day you began to pray, the Lord answered. But there is a principality over Greece that is what? That is contending with your answer. For 21 days. God answered. But the adversary blocked the answer. For some of you, if only you will pray Jesus came to them and said, couldn't you wait with me for one hour? Couldn't you pray? Tell Christians, we're going to pray for five minutes. It's like you just handed them a death sentence. <laughs> uh, say, I bear witness. He has zeal. I bear witness. He has zeal for you. That is why. Oh, I wish my children would come to know the Lord. Okay, what zeal are you showing to us that? Right. Back it up. Wait a labor in prayer. Yes. <laughs> People come to me, oh, Pastor, I say, go and pray. Go and pray. There is power in prayer. Yes. There is yes. power in prayer. Yes. Fervently. James chapter 5 verse 16. James 5 16. The Bible says, I want you to just look at look at the, the part B there, look at the second part there. The first part talks about confessing your trespasses one to another. But well, look at part B. It's, part B says that effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now people think when you are born again, oh Jesus has done it all, you don't have to pray. Now, who does it say is praying? The righteous man. When you think of when you come to church or when you give your life to Christ, that's it, you don't have to pray anymore. No, no, no. That's when you start to pray. Because at that time, before you were born again, you were friends with the world. You were friends with the enemy. You are agreed with him. But now you have become an enemy to him. That is when your prayer life kicks off. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so who is praying? The righteous man. Prayer is not for the sinner. The righteous man. A sinner is a sinner. The righteous man. The effective, fervent prayer of avails what? I told us what the meaning of avail is. What the word avail means. Avails means to carry power. To have strength to overcome. To be a force. And so the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man carries power. That's what it means. 
into his power. The reason the devil has become so comfortable in your home is because there is no power in your prayer. <laughs> power. When you labor in prayer, Jesus prayed to the point that even the sweat were like what? Drops of blood. Labor. Labor. I see that devil that will stand before him. Labor in prayer. The Lord has given us weapons that, that, that the devil cannot withstand. Yeah. And yet we don't know how to use it. The force of prayer is a powerful one. Number four, when we come to church, learn to give to God. So learn to listen to the word, learn to worship and pray. The other thing, learn to give. The sister came to me this morning after first service. She said, Pastor, when you don't preach about giving, you are robbing us of our blessing. I say, I know, my sister, I know. Your pastor just doesn't like to talk about finances. <laughs> but you see, I am robbing you when I don't teach you about giving. Right. I'm robbing you. And so I don't want to rob you anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I will teach you because I don't want to steal from you. Huh? When you come to church, you know, when Mr. Lupe read this morning, Malachi, 8, uh, Malachi 3, verse 8, God said, it says, you have robbed me. And he said, where are you have you robbed you? And the Lord said, you have robbed me what? In tithes and what? In offering. I'm going to teach on this. Don't worry. You, you, you get the full teaching. Amen. And will the man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what have we robbed you? In tithes and now I didn't say in tithes or offerings. So there are two things. You have robbed God in tithes and offerings. Right. When you come to the house of God, what you go to verse 10? Go to verse 10. God Himself said, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will be not enough room to receive it. I told them this morning, I have listened to many men of God preach or tithing. I've listened to many of them preach against it. And I laugh. And I listen to their arguments. The word of God is clear. And some of them say, you are already saved. God does not need your tithe. You don't need to tithe to be saved. Sometimes when you argue and you bring up certain points, it gets overruled because it is inconsequential to the matter being discussed. Salvation was not mentioned here. So salvation is inconsequential to the matter of tithing. Hey, somebody listening to me. God didn't say bring your tithe so that you may be saved. Hallelujah. Now, as a matter of fact, who is he writing to? To the Jews or to the Gentiles? The Jews. His people. He wasn't talking to the Gentiles or the unsaved. He was talking to what? His people. So salvation was not the matter here. So inconsequential. Number two. I'm going to teach on this. I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to teach on tithing so you understand. Now, some, some people are very faithful tithers. Very faithful. God bless you. But when I teach on it, I want you to have more understanding. Wow. Thank God I do this. For those who do 
don't do it, you have understanding to do it. And so they say, well, when Jesus died, he abolished the law. Tithing was under the law. How many of you know the Ten Commandments? If you don't know the Ten Commandments, <laughs> You go to the children's department for one second. <laughs> <laughs> Tithing is not part of the law, and so cannot be abolished with the law. It's not part of it. <laughs> I was. Oh my God, listen, I have tons of sermons that I've never, trust me, I just write, I walk in a sermon, the Lord gives me three others, I put it on the side. I was walking in one sermon, and, and, and the Lord said something. Remember that woman, the woman, have you heard of the, the widow's point? Have you heard of that? The woman that gave those two, two coins, right? Do you know what Jesus did? Ah, I'm going ahead of myself. Jesus stood near the offering bowl. Do you know that? Is there the Bible? Jesus. And when the woman came and dropped it, Jesus said, take this. You don't need to give this. Take it with you. Come. Is that what the Bible said? No. no. <laughs> oh, God so loved us. He wouldn't want us to give time. No. He let her drop it. Because he wouldn't rob her of her blessings. So some of us don't understand things. Oh, Jesus, no, 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 no. Jesus never stopped you from giving. Right. Never. He stood there. That was all she had. He confirmed it. That was all she had. Jesus confirmed it. Yet he let her drop it. God himself. People make arguments sometimes and listen to me. What are you saying? Have you read the scripture? You read the scripture. As a matter of fact, he said, I have not come to abolish the law, but to what? Fulfill all righteousness. Yes. He said himself. So which law are they talking about? I'm not going to go there. I'm just here to teach you so you have understanding. And so when the woman came to me, she said this morning, she said, Pastor, you are robbing us of our blessing. Teach us to tie. Because since I've been tithing, I've seen how the Lord has blessed me. She said, I'm 70. I said, what? You look 50 to me. I'm 70. Say, I don't have a doctor. He said, I will repeat the devourer for your sake. It's part of the promises. The woman said, I don't have a medical doctor. God repeat the devourer. I remember when Mr. Hector gave a testimony here. It was so funny. He said, every time the Lord said tight, he refused to tight. <laughs> The Lord said that. How much was the tithe that day? One, 198. His tithe was 198 that month. He knew it. He can't believe the Lord said, give me the tithe. The word says, bring your tithe. It's a command. Bring. Oh. That's the word of God. So people say, I want to give your tithe. Why did say, give your tithe? God says, bring it. Why? Because it doesn't belong to you. That's why he used the word bring. When he said, give it give because it belongs to you, please give me. No, no, no. God used the word bring. It's not yours. And that's why he said, you are robbing me. Because it's not yours. It's never yours. And so, 198, he didn't want to pay his life. He was giving God reasons why he can't pay his life. And he was driving, he was $198 richer until a blue light began to shine behind his car. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, well, could, that be, could those be angels following him? No, those were cops. <laughs> and the man pulled him over. Then you were, you were not speeding, you are going below the speed limit. Good, good. okay, above, okay. <laughs> and the man pulled him over, wrote him a ticket. Guess how much it was? 198. <laughs> when I got married to this woman, sitting down here. Listen, 
I used to be that. I used to struggle with my time. I used to. And I was in ministry. I was in ministry. I was struggling with giving God my time. Struggling. Until I asked for a wife and the Lord gave me Clementina. <laughs> You see her walking around. Have you paid your time? <laughs> Have you paid your time? <laughs> no, is it your money? It's my money. She said, no, no, I don't want to be a part of this curse. No, no, you must pay your time. I worked for it. I don't want, you can ask her, I don't want to be a part of this curse. He says, for you are cursed with a curse. Now, when I teach on this, I'm going to take you deeper into some things you didn't know was in the Bible. You're going to go, wow. If I told your descendants, do you know that? I will teach you. Don't worry when the time comes. <laughs> I was reading when I was preparing this, this, this sermon on the sea, the power of the sea. There's a place in the Bible that says, you leave inheritance for your children, but it wastes in their hands. I read it and I go, whoa. Have you seen millionaires that die? And their children become an entity and they lose all the money? You understand that the word of God is true. He said, Forever thy word is settled in heaven. Right. Heaven and earth all pass, but not the word of God. Yeah. Doesn't matter who you are. Yeah. I will teach on this and you understand. We don't give to God because we are compelled to give, no. It is because we have understanding. The Bible says a man can receive nothing unless it be given to him from above. And so whatever you have, Paul said, what is it you have that God did not give unto you? Understanding. Understanding. And all the Lord is saying is bring it so that I will bless you. He didn't say bring it so you make heaven. No, 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 you will make heaven. You make, you make heaven. But I'm talking about pouring out a blessing. Such a blessing upon you. It's not about salvation. It is about honoring God with your substance. Conduct in church. When it's time for offering and tithing, you're happy. Where's my envelope? I want to give for all that he has done for me. Amen. For the life that I am. Amen. For the future. For his plans for my life. God, I want to give this. What shall I render unto the Lord for all that he has given me? I will bring praise to his name. And I will offer that which surely cost me something. Hallelujah. Because my God is worthy of it all. Glory. This is why I give. Some Sundays I go and I'm going to close here, so we'll take the communion. I wish everyone that traveled today, I wish people were still trying to preach this so they hear me. The pastor's preaching from Bible. He's born again now. The other day, you know, when my wife plays the keyboard, she gives me her tie so I can put a basket for her. And so she handed me three envelopes the other day. I was like, three envelopes? Oh, this woman is making money under my nose that I didn't know. <laughs> we need to talk about this. <laughs> well, listen to me. You, you didn't have to use wisdom and be in charge of the house. Amen. That will be the head. Amen. Why <laughs> don't you give me three envelopes? I'm like, ah. <laughs> and so I... She just looked in the <laughs> You know, our envelopes are designed in such a way that you write your name and you cover it. So nobody sees your name. Nobody sees what you, you wrote. I mean, I, how many of you even use the envelopes? God bless you. So when you write, you notice you can seal it. You can cover it. The other flap comes over. So I had to open it to see. I opened it. One had her name. The other one had Jonathan's name. The third one had Joanna's name. Even my baby that 
is just a month and what? A week old or so. She's already tithing on her behalf. Multiplication. 